the Hyperman EF600 is a very unique device and one that I'm finding to be equal parts wonderful and slightly infuriating. I've seen at least one other review that talks about one of the issues that I have with it or maybe even two of the issues that I have with it. But then there's a couple more that I've found along the way and it just offsets what could actually be one of the nicest sounding devices that I've played with in quite a while. EF600 comes in at $799 US dollars and it features Hyferman's own Himalaya Pro R2R DAC chip inside as well as a built-in headphone amplifier. So it's a fully featured DAC, headphone amp and it will output to your external speaker amp, other headphone amps etc. And all of that's packaged up in this pretty unique sort of monolithic design. That brings both some positives and some negatives as we'll talk about in a moment. But before we get to a tour of the device and talk about the design of it, I should mention what's going on internally. I've already mentioned that it's got an internal R2R DAC chip, which I should specify is the Himalaya Pro chip from Hyferman. And that's really, I think, for me, where the magic lies in this one. Before we get to a tour of the device and talk about the design and the features of it, the one final thing I wanted to mention was that the EF600 can output over 5 watts, just over 5 watts, into a 32 ohm load from its balanced headphone socket. So it's also a very powerful headphone amp in addition to that wonderful R2R DAC chip. And so with that said, on paper, we're looking at something that should be quite good. Let me explain to you now why maybe it's not so much. And we're going to do that by going on a bit of a tour of the device. Starting on the front here, things are nicely designed. I like the layout. I like the general functionality. And that is that we've got the ability to choose between four different modes. This is going through a high gain and a low gain in each case, as well as an oversampling and non-oversampling option in each case. So in other words, you can choose whether the DAC is using oversampling or non-oversampling modes. And then you can choose whether the amplifier is in high gain or low gain mode. And that makes a lot of sense. If you're using this as an all-in-one, it makes sense to have it set up that way in some ways. But having said that, I would have probably preferred two different switches. I would have liked one switch that goes between oversampling and non-oversampling, and another switch that goes between high gain and low gain. As it is though, this is how Hyferman have done it. I don't mind it so much. It's just a little bit clunky. If you just want to switch between the gain modes, you've sometimes got to cycle through the oversampling modes as well and vice versa. Next to the gain and sampling mode switch, we've got a different switch here, which is for the input. And this will cycle through your different digital inputs and your different analog inputs too. Nothing groundbreaking, nothing fancy, just nicely implemented. Below that, we've got a volume control, and this is the first issue that I've got with the unit, and that is that the volume control has huge amounts of wobble in it. It feels really, really cheap. I also don't particularly like the square design of it. It doesn't feel nice, even if the motion was better. It doesn't feel nice to interact with because it's so square and blocky. So I do think a round volume knob would have been nice, and way less play in it would have been good too. Moving down below the volume control, everything else is fine. We've got a 4-pin XLR and a 6.3mm socket. Both of those are fine to interact with, although I will say that I do find connecting the 4-pin XLR can be a little bit snug, and it can be a little bit awkward and it sort of wants to push the device across the desk when you're plugging it in, and then pull it back when you're unplugging it. And that's really going to come down to the lack of friction, because the footprint's quite small, and the overall weight of the device as well, which is relatively light for the size and the scale of the device and the sorts of things you're plugging into it. As we continue the tour, let's jump around to the back now and then I'll come back to the sides. Looking at the back of the device and starting at the bottom, we've got our mains power connector and mains power switch. This is the only power switch on the device. So for those of you like me that don't like a power switch on the back, this is one of those devices. There is no way to put the unit into standby from the front panel. We've then got XLR outputs and RCA outputs so you can take the DAC feed out to external amplifiers. 
And then above that, as I've already alluded to from the front input switch, we've also got RCA inputs and XLR inputs. So you can just run this as a headphone app if you want to. Finally, up the top, we've got our little cluster of digital inputs. And what we've got here specifically is a USB-C, a USB-B, a coaxial for Spitif, and a Bluetooth antenna as well. While we're talking about Bluetooth, it is worth mentioning that there's LDAC in here, so you've got high quality Bluetooth codecs involved. And that makes for a nice collection of inputs. I would have liked to see optical on here, but I understand that we're going to be limited for space. The one final thing I would have liked to see, and it probably would have gone on the front panel, even though it's relevant to the back panel here, is that I would have liked to see some kind of toggle system to switch the headphone and the outputs on the back switch between them. As it is, everything's working all the time. So if you are sending these outputs to an external amp, your headphones are still going to be running, and that may mean you have to unplug your headphones any time that you're using external speakers. It's a minor thing, but it's something I would have liked to see. The other thing I would have loved to see is a volume control for the outputs, so you could have used them with active speakers. As it is, these are just line level outputs, they're constantly at 2 volts or 4 volts, whatever the output is for each connection. And so it does mean that you're not going to be able to use these with actives unless you've got volume controlled active speakers. So there's a couple of minor drawbacks there, nothing that's a deal breaker, but just a few things that I find a little bit clunky about the design and the interaction with the EF600. As for the vertical design, I don't mind it, I don't particularly love it, but it's not the end of the world. I understand why they've done it this way, it's partly for cooling, it's also to make it into this headphone stand design. And that does bring us around to another point that I've seen brought up in a different review, I think it was Josh Valor. He mentioned the fact that it's kind of nice that because this gets a bit warm, it does warm up your headphones, which is nice in winter, but in summer, not so much. You don't really want to be putting on hot headphones on a hot day, and that's definitely what this is going to do. They're not hot to the point that they're uncomfortable, but if you're already working in a hot environment, living in a hot environment, you're not going to want to put something warm over your ears. So that's a bit of a drawback. It's also for me a bit of an issue that all of this is made of plastic. And the reason for that is that I've actually noticed that the EF600 picks up cell phone noise. I've had my mobile phone sitting on the desk about sort of that far away from the EF600 and have all kinds of noise go through the headphone output of the EF600 when my phone's done some data transfer. And what I mean by that was the phone was just sitting on the desk. It obviously was getting some sort of information, picking up emails, whatever it was doing while it was sitting idle. And that was enough that I heard significant noise through the EF600. And I can only assume that's because you've got these big bands of plastic that essentially are providing no shielding to the circuitry within. So that for me is a bit of a drawback. One final issue that I've had with the EF600, and I haven't been able to nail this down, but every now and again, I just get a slight pop or a slight crack. It's quite a low level sound, but I just get these very tiny little pops or cracks coming through the outputs. I can only assume that there's some kind of connectivity issue where something that I've got connected is creating a loop of some description. Maybe it's whatever I've had connected to the spit of input or something is actually grounding out through the EF600 and creating a bit of a loop there, I'm not sure. But I just occasionally have heard this little pop or little crack and it's just enough to distract me. It's not harsh, it's not loud, there was no risk of it damaging the gear I was listening to. But it was distracting, it was enough to make me go, hang on, what was that noise? So I just thought I'd raise that one. It could be a one-off with this unit, I'm not entirely sure. And as I talk about this unit, I just realized I should say a huge thanks to Appos Audio for getting this one out to me. Appos have been a great supporter of the channel, making reviews like this one possible, so thank you to them. And as always, I'll put links through to them down below, so you can support them and me by buying from those links, and say thank you to them for making these reviews possible. But moving on now, let's start talking about how the EF600 sounds. Because I told you at the beginning that this is a device that I equally love and kind of have some issues with. And the reason I love it is because I think some aspects of its sound are absolutely fabulous. Starting off just listening to this in isolation, and I've tried it with a bunch of different headphones. I've tried it in all sorts of different setups. So everything I'm telling you is more general. It doesn't seem to have any issues running dynamic drivers versus planar magnetics. I've not found any problems at all, no matter what I've run it with. And what I've consistently heard is a very enjoyable sound. It's a sound that is smooth but detailed. It's not thick and rich like some r 2 DACs can get. Something like the Aries 2 from Denifritz, for example, I never really warmed to. But for me, the EF600, both the combination of its headphone amp and its internal DAC, work to produce a very enjoyable, smooth but detailed sound. And ultimately, as I spent more and more time with the EF600, I would describe its sound as unremarkable in a very good way. Nothing jumps out from the sound of the EF600, and that makes it easy to enjoy for long periods. 
Where things get particularly interesting, though, is when you start playing with different modes. In its oversampling mode, I feel like the image becomes a bit tighter, a bit more focused. But then when you go across to the NOS mode, things become a bit more lifelike to me. One of the tracks that I listened to during my playing around with the EO600 was enough to make me stop and jump into this document that I use for my notes and actually take down a note, and that was the first rule of love by Delamitri. Flicking between the oversampling mode and the non-oversampling mode on this particular track, what I really clearly noticed was the guitar sounded so natural in NOS mode. In oversampling mode, as I said, things like the image and the focus of the image got a bit sharper and cleaner, but everything just sounded real in NOS mode. And in that respect, it kind of reminds me a little bit of vinyl. With vinyl, you get a sense of that kind of just easy realism of the music, and that's what the NOS mode of this reminded me of. I'm not saying it's identical to vinyl. My point is they both have a similar quality, which is just there's an ease to it. There's no harshness, there's no glare, there's no enhancement. It's just music flowing out of your speakers or your headphones. And this is true whether it is speakers via the external outputs or whether it's headphones via the internal output or an external headphone amp. And so the good news is that with something like the EF600, those that are seeking detail and focus and imaging, you can switch over to the oversampling mode and get that. It's not going to quite be the same as a full-on high-detail Delta Sigma DAC, but it's going to get pretty close. At the same time, though, you can switch it into the NOS mode and get that wonderful, natural, easy-to-listen-to sound. For my listening, I initially thought I preferred this in oversampling mode, but as time went on, it was the NOS mode that I kept coming back to over and over again. And then the other good news is that if you want to use something like HQ Player, you can then do that and feed it into the EF600 using NOS mode and get the benefits of those external filters. While well, we're talking about comparisons of different features and functions of the EF600, let's talk about the RCA versus the XLR. And the good news is that when I ran this out to an external headphone amp, the RCA and the XLR outputs are both almost identical. I think the RCA outputs might be just ever so slightly smoother, but the reason I'm saying I think they might be is that because you've got different voltage outputs on the XLR and RCA, by the time you do the volume matching, I couldn't clearly say that one was different to the other. I think the RCA was just a little bit smoother, a little bit less separated, maybe a little bit less textured, but we're talking about a 1% or 2% shift. It was close enough that, as I said, by the time I did volume matching, I'm not confident in that at all. And that's good news. That means that you can use this to two different amplifiers if you want to. Maybe you're going to send an output to a tube amp and an output to a solid state amp. Whatever the use case or the purpose is, the good news is you can use both RCA and XLR and enjoy essentially identical quality. And so at this point, I was really thoroughly enjoying what I was hearing from the EF600. Those minor gripes aside, things like that little popping noise, the cellular interference, which has only actually happened once in the whole time I've been playing with the EF600, Things like that and the volume knob, they're all minor things that aren't enough to get in the way of the fact that it does sound lovely. It's a really enjoyable sounding device. But that of course got me wondering, exactly how good is it? And so as always, I decided to do some comparisons and see just how good it really is. The first comparison I wanted to make was between the DAC in this and an external DAC. And so I compared the EF600 in oversampling mode with the Bifrost 264 from SHIT. Now I did it in oversampling mode because the Bifrost 264 was also in oversampling mode, so I wanted an apples for apples comparison. And listening to Nothing's Real But Love by Rebecca Ferguson, what I heard from the EF600 was a sound that was detailed, it was crisp, but still very smooth. There's a richness and a solidness to the sound from the EF600 that I really enjoy, but as I said before, it doesn't get into smoothness or thickness at all, and that's great. Moving over to the Bifrost 264, and I do feel like it was giving a better sense of space in the sound. I think particularly depth in the sound stage was improved a bit from the Bifrost 2, and the sound was a little bit more textured as well. So I think from a technical point of view, the Bifrost 264 is a little bit better, but keep in mind you're spending about the same amount and you're only getting a DAC in the Bifrost 2. So it is going to come down a little bit to what it is that you're looking for. I think if you're looking for technical prowess, the Bifrost 264 is probably the one that I would choose. But having said that, if you're looking for relaxed, musical enjoyment with a wonderfully natural sound, then I'd actually switch this one over to NOS mode, and I might end up choosing the EF600 over and above the Bifrost 2 for pure musical enjoyment. As I said, I think technically the Bifrost 2 is the better DAC, but the EF600 does some wonderful things in that NOS mode. The main conclusion to draw from this, though, is that both are wonderful DACs. 
And that was really what I was looking for, was to make sure that what you're spending on the EF600 is not giving you something that's performing well below what the competition does. And the good news is that you're spending about the same amount as the Bifrost 2. You're getting a DAC that's almost at the same level technically, in some ways could be better from an enjoyment point of view, and then also it's got a built-in headphone amp should you want to use it. And speaking of headphone amps, that was my other key question. How good is the headphone amp within the EF600? And so I paired it up against the Trishelli Labs A3 Pro, which is just an outstanding headphone app for its price. And I did this knowing that it was going to be very, very tough competition. But the key question was, do you go out and buy yourself two separates, a DAC and a headphone amp for about the same, maybe a little bit more than the EF600? And in doing so, can you get vastly better sound? What we've already started to see is that if you're going to split the cost of the EF600 into a DAC and an amplifier, the DAC is not going to be better than what you get in the EF600, because realistically, the only DACs that are going to come close to the performance of something like a Bifrost 264 and giving you that same quality as an R2R DAC or a multi-bit from shit, the only DACs that do that are going to cost about the same amount as the whole EF600. So we know the DAC is doing a great job. Moving over then to the amplifier, and I was curious to see if the A3 Pro from Giselli Labs was way better. We're spending about 500 odd US dollars on an A3 Pro, so it's already above half the price of the EF600. And listening to Shorty Don't Wait by Great Big World, what I heard was an amplifier in the EF600 that's pretty solid. It's not as good as the A3 Pro, and not much is at the price, but it is doing a pretty good job. My initial testing began with the Focal Utopia 2022 models. I've got that review coming soon. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see that one. And the first thing I noticed about the EF600 was the staging is fairly intimate. It's not a big, vast soundstage. It does put you fairly close to the music, but it doesn't feel congested or too much in your face. It's just a slightly intimate sounding presentation. The clarity and the tonality of the sound are both excellent from the EF600. And sounds like the bass drum have a good sense of punch, but are well controlled by the amp and the DAC combined. As the choir joins in in this particular track, the EF600 did a good job of maintaining separation. I felt like I could clearly and easily hear where the main vocalist was, where the instruments were, where the choir was. The staging was still compact, but separation was good within it. And then the other thing that stood out to me was that it sounds like the percussion, I think there's a shaker in this track from memory, Sounds like that were clear and detailed, but not over-enhanced, not pushed at me. They were still smooth and very easy to listen to. In other words, they were just right. Moving over then to the A3 Pro, and I felt like I got just a little bit more space in the sound overall. And then there was also some extra nuance in the sound. There were tiny little details, and I'm going to call them micro details, because they were so subtle that it wasn't like I felt, even when I went back to the EF600, it wasn't like I felt anything was missing. But going to the A3 Pro, it was like I could hear little subtle kind of nuances. It's the sort of thing where a guitar aficionado, for instance, might have been able to tell which exact brand of guitar was being played on the A3 Pro, whereas maybe they wouldn't have been able to from the EF600. And what I'm talking about here are tiny little senses of nuance, harmonics, texture, very, very subtle things that, as I said, you don't notice are missing. It's not like the EF600 sounded smooth or rolled off or smoothed over or anything like that. But there was just that tiny little bit more kind of clarity or color or resolution from the A3 Pro. As the track carried on, I'd say the A3 Pro's presentation overall wasn't vastly different in terms of size and staging compared to the EF600. There was a slightly greater sense of separation in the sounds, but everything was still fairly compact and fairly intimate, which is partly this track, but also as I listened to other tracks as well, I didn't feel like the EF600 fell far behind the A3 Pro in terms of soundstage size and space, but separation of instruments was consistently a bit better and noticeably better on the A3 Pro. And so overall to me, I feel like the A3 Pro was a clear improvement over the EF600, Things like that nuance, that detail, and that little bit more space or separation, all of that added up to a better experience. But it also said to me that the amp in the EF600 isn't bad. I don't think it's as good as the DAC. I think it does hold the DAC back a little bit, but it's by no means a bad amplifier stage. And so that means for those of you that are looking at this as an all-in-one single box solution, it's actually a really good one. For the price you're paying, I think you're going to be really hard pressed to buy two separate devices, that being a DAC and a headphone amp, that are going to match what the EF600 is giving you. 
Now, it's probably worth mentioning at this point that the first test I did of the amplifier, as I said before, was with the Focal Utopia 2022. But I also wanted to try it with a planar magnetic, and this is because when I reviewed the lower level EF400 from Hyferman, I found that their performance with dynamics and with planers was a bit different. But the good news is I didn't really find that with the EF600. So moving over to something like the Mesa Elites and running that with the EF600 and then the A3 Pro amplifier, I found that the performance was basically the same. There was a slight difference. I think if anything, the Elites got even better with the A3 Pro, but that could also come down to product synergy and also the different tracks I was using. But the key thing is it wasn't like there was a drastic fall off when I went between all different headphones with EF600. So whether it was the 300 ohm ZMF Atrium, or whether it was the Hyferman Aria Organics, the Elites, the Focal Utopias, the Sennheiser HD 660S2, everything sounded good out of the EF600. So that's a really good sign. You can buy this and drive anything with it and get great sound. And so where all this brings me to is that I think in oversampling mode, I think the EF600 is just a decent solid all-in-one. What sets it apart for me though is the ability to run it in non-oversampling mode. It has such a lovely, natural sound, a fluid delivery, still good detail, but not as good detail as in oversampling mode, but you don't really care about the detail because everything sounds so natural and lifelike in the non-oversampling mode. For my mind, the EF600 is a really solid product from a sonic point of view. The ability to then pair it with an even better headphone amp and get even better sound out of that DAC is an extra bonus. And so it's an interesting product for me to recommend or not recommend. And I haven't really decided what I want to say here. I think in some ways I want to recommend it because I love what the DAC is capable of. I don't mind the headphone output, but I particularly like it with an external headphone amp. However, I do think it's also worth going in with your eyes open. Be aware of the fact that it is going to heat up your headphones if you're using it as a headphone stand. Be aware of the fact that the volume control is a little bit naff. And also know that depending on what you connect it up to, you may hear those little pops and cracks that I mentioned earlier. And so I think where I'm going to leave it is not necessarily a recommendation, but I am going to say that it's a product that I think you should check out for yourself. Have a think about what matters to you. Maybe check some other reviews, chat online to people, see if anyone else has experienced what I have with this in terms of those little tiny cracks and pops. And on that note, if you've experienced it for yourself, if you've got one of these, let us know if you ever hear that through your headphones. Is it just my unit? Did I happen to get one that's got a slight issue with it? So drop a comment down below if you've owned one of these or still own one of these. Drop a comment down below and let us know your experiences. But for now, I'm going to close things off by saying I think the DAC in this is marvellous. I can't wait to hear more from Hyferman's Himalaya Pro DAC. And I am going to say that if you're looking for an all-in-one solution for less than $1,000, this should be pretty high on your list. I think without spending a bit more than this and getting two separate boxes and then the extra cables and whatnot that goes with it, I think you're going to have a really hard time matching the sound of the EF600. It's a beautiful device, especially in NOS mode. So give it a go for yourself. Try it out if you can. And as I said, if you own one, let us know your experiences in the comments down below. For now though, I hope you found this video useful and helpful. And if you have, please hit the like button and subscribe and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave it to the music, so happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.